So last week, last week, I, uh, Eileen and I had a birthday, and uh, I got a card uh, from Larry and Karen Stone, <laughs> and uh, it's a cup, I think it's supposed to be Eileen and I, and uh, the lady's sitting at the table, and then the man has the plate of spaghetti dumped on his head, and spaghetti on the walls, and sauce, and meatballs on the floor, you know, the dinner, Arnold, and it says, I give up. How many women with PMS does it take to screw in a light bulb, funny boy? <laughs> <laughs> so that got me thinking. First of all, I thought of the church, you know, <laughs> and uh, and then uh, I thought, why is it that relationships seem so tough sometimes? Why is it that there's uh, uh, it's never really easy, and there are misunderstandings and. Uh, and the spaghetti sometimes lands on, on my head. And, uh, and so I want us to look at love and some of the issues in it. And uh, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, um, it's a passage that probably many of you had read at your weddings. That's, uh, that's often where I find this read. Um, I'm going to start in verse 3. If I give all that I possess to the poor and... Surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might love and be loved the way you always intended it. That's our, that's our need today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Years ago, years ago, I, I should tell you, uh, I was asked to speak at a conference in St. Louis, big, big conference. Was really, yeah, I felt really good being asked to go there. And uh, about a week before I was supposed to fly out to speak at this conference, I realized I had no idea what the theme was. I, I never asked, uh, what am I supposed to talk on? You know, and uh, make up some stuff. And uh, so I called people up and I said, uh, I'm really looking forward to coming and being your speaker at this uh, conference. but do you have an idea what the theme might be? And they said, oh yeah, you're speaking on how to be the world's greatest lover. <laughs> <laughs> Dang! <laughs> well, well, I said, how did you come up with that and me? And, you know, same sentence, how did you get that? They said, well, you know, we." We read some of your books and we heard some sermon tapes and things like that, and and uh, and we realized that uh, people usually speak on what they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, you know, you obviously don't know anything about this, so it would really be uh, fresh. <laughs> <laughs> so. I usually don't spend a lot of time preaching on 1 Corinthians 13 because it's all about love, and, and frankly, it's been a struggle for me, you know, I should say. Uh, and uh, anyone who's been around me very long knows that. But, um, but I'm, I'm going, if this description of love, if, if God is love and, and uh, his love is lived out in us and is intended for us to be experienced, then these become descriptive phrases and characteristics of God. And this becomes uh, the evidence of God's experience in our life and his presence and his power at work in our lives. That each of these things, uh, patience and kindness and not envying and not boasting and not proud and not rude and not self-seeking and not easily angered and keeping no record of wrongs and not delighting in evil, but rejoicing in the truth and protecting and trusting and hoping and persevering and never failing. But that is uh, what our experience of God's love is supposed to be in our lives. And then, by implication, 
as we allow ourselves to experience God's love like this, then it starts to seep out, right? It starts to seep out and uh, begins to affect the way we treat people, and then pretty soon their experience of God's love is, is experienced through us. That's basically the message here. Now, the, the difficulty is, is that, frankly, uh, when I look at my own life, I, it's been difficult for me to, to actually experience that all the time, right? Sometimes, but it's, it's hard. Uh, and sometimes we don't experience that kind of uh, amazing love that, that Scripture tells us about and tells us, you know, this is what, how God is with you. If you'd let him, if you'd accept that. And, uh, and this is how you can be in your relationships and at work in different places. And, and it, can, it can be real and tangible and, and meaningful. But something goes wrong. You ever notice that? Um, anybody ever struggled in a relationship? Am I the only one? <laughs> oh, well, oh, I knew that. I mean, you, not you, not you, just him. I'm, I'm, I, I get it. I totally get that. Um, uh, one of, the, one of the best insights uh, I got was Rollo Mays, a psychiatrist. Uh, before he died, he lived in the Bay Area and uh, wrote a book called Love and Will, which is an amazing uh, look as a, a psychiatrist. But um, he says this, the books that roll off the presses have techniques in love and sex, and they're best sellers for a few weeks, but they have a hollow ring. For most people seem aware at some level that the frantic quality with which we pursue technique is in direct proportion to the degree in which we've lost sight of the answer. It's an old and ironic habit of human beings to run faster when we've lost our way. We run faster when we've lost our way. So I was in Barnes & Noble this week, uh, down in Escondido, California. <laughs> Where it rained, it was cold and windy. Uh, but uh, so I'll go to Barnes and Noble, and they have this big display of um, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, because I guess the movie was opening this weekend, and that's a big thing, kind of chick porn. And uh, and so they have this big display, and as I'm walking by, of course, I'm not looking at it because you know, to the pure, all things are pure. So I'm walking by, and in the corner of my eye. I, I look at the display, and there, someone had put the book Fifty Shades of Chicken, <laughs> a cookbook. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Fifty Shades of, of Chicken. So I, I'm drawn over, and I start reading it, laughing hysterically because it really is good. And uh, everybody thinks I'm reading Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> well, look at the rim right there. <laughs> So, but it, but it really struck me that what Rollo May is saying is true, and that is that that we look for techniques and we look for something uh, that that will help us be better lovers, better uh, in, uh, in our relationships, and all these things. And and the, the more lost we are, the, the faster we run. But we don't know where we're running to, and we're making great effort uh, without great accomplishment. And so I, th I think he's right. Now, when we lose our way and we're running faster, I start thinking about, okay, so there's layers of relationships. And I've spent a lot of time in, in relationships and, and in uh, unrelationships, you know, where you're with people, but you're not really in a relationship with them. You ever done that? And, uh, and I realized that in the unrelationship side, there's a few things that happen, in there, and I think at the core at the very core is the, the understanding and the suspicion that love hurts. Love hurts. And so rather than move towards what God intends for us, and rather than allowing God to love us the way uh, it's described here in the scripture, We run faster in other directions. And so one way that we do that is we are with people, but we're withholding and we don't connect and we keep to ourselves. 
I had a friend that I, I used to talk with every once in a while, and uh, and every time he would start to share something personal, he would interrupt himself and say, I think I'll keep that close to my chest. Well, why'd you bring it up? <laughs> you know, and he'd start to share something that he's struggling with. You know, I'm going to keep that close to my chest. And, and he said that over and over again. Finally, I went, I can't, I have no relationship with this person. He may have a fabulous relationship with his chest, <laughs> but not with me, because there's a barrier that, that keeps us from moving toward each other. And he loved being with me because I'm just spilling everything, you know. <laughs> and uh, But it wasn't reciprocal. And I, I realized that this kind of withholding is protecting ourselves, keeping our secrets, keeping our away. We don't have to connect. And we don't have to engage. And we don't have to get involved. And get this, we don't have to hurt. We don't have to. We just stay distant. Even when we're near people, we can stay distant. Another one is that we do um, uh, unrelationships by working really hard, not, not to love and allow ourselves to be loved, but to please people and try and get them to please us. And uh, almost like a barter system. And uh, I think it comes out of uh, not wanting to hurt. That's what it comes out of. And so we look in people's eyes to try and figure out what they want from us, and then we decide whether or not we want to give that to them, be that for them, uh, act that way for them, and we look for clues, and then we decide whether we'll do it. And then at the same time, we look for people who will look in our eyes and then try and please us. And everybody's getting along. Everybody's doing it. And I got people in my life who are pleasing me and I'm pleasing them. Everything. It's not love. It may not even be a relationship. It's something else. It's a way to keep from hurting. <coughs> we don't have to hurt. Because as long as we're pleasing and looking to be pleased, we're really just actors on a stage. And not Academy Award actors. I mean, we're talking about really mediocre actors, B-movie actors. You know, uh, not very good at it, but we're still doing it. You know, and the really bad actors uh, are usually the ones that it's obvious they're acting, right? And that's what we do. And uh, and it's sad because we miss out on actually experiencing being loved, and we miss out on loving the people around us and taking down that defense. And we miss out on hurting, because we don't have to care. Okay, so the third one. It's not the way we do unrelationships, and I'm, um, it's the controlling thing, and we've talked about that, I'm sorry, I keep bringing it up, you know, and uh, the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's control, and, um, Today, can you believe that today, this morning, here in this sacred house of God, I was accused of being a controller. <laughs> Not just that, though. Someone who will go unnamed, Deborah Murdy, even <laughs> said that I was a paranoid controller. <laughs> today. And I'm sitting here thinking, I was going to preach about this to you people. <laughs> and I got accused of it. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. See, we were getting the uh, refreshments ready and everything, and uh, and and other people were helping, cutting up donuts and putting out the bagels and making the coffee. And and uh, well, we've got to get the cream cheese out. And I'm going through the cupboards and I can't find the cream cheese bowl that you put out. And they, and people would say, "Well, use this bowl." No, no, it's too deep. That's not the bowl we use. It's got to be the right cream cheese bowl. We'll use that. No, that's too too wide. That doesn't work. And then I saw it up on the sink, back by the faucets, the cream cheese bowl filled with 
brushes and soap and cleaning products sitting there in our cream cheese bowl. And I flipped out. <laughs> this is just wrong. This is <laughs> and they all went, whoa, he's really a controller. It's not just a way to, it has to be done in Westfall's way. <laughs> and, you know, and, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh no, this is about me too. Oh. But you know, when we're controlling, the good thing about that is, is that we can try and get people to act a certain way. We can try and get people to think a certain way. We can get them to do things a certain step-by-step uh, -step way. And, um, and we don't have to love. We don't have to actually relate. Because we're right, right? We're right. We have a better way. Uh, somebody uh, had, had, who was much more organized than I had put on the refrigerator out there in the kitchen a uh, full page, small print, typed out step by step, but how do you make the coffee and get out the donuts? <laughs> this whole big thing. And one of, one of our friends here who looked at it and went, well, it's obvious why this doesn't work. It needs to be done as a checklist, not paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, see, there's a right way to do even this. And, and, and I thought, isn't it small things that we get so controlling about and we get so upset about? Uh, this week we were down at, uh, I hate to say it, Lawrence Welk Resort. Uh, should be in South Dakota, but it was in San Diego. And, uh, and Eileen was having lunch in the uh, restaurant there. I was off with Damien, and she was having lunch there, and a busload of Lawrence Welk fans poured in because they were going to have the matinee of the King and I, and they came for the lunch beforehand. And so they're all in line. And so now she's waiting like 20 minutes to get seated. And she's standing there in line behind this couple. And she said, John, you would have hated it. You would have gone crazy. You would have ripped a hole in the wall of that place. I went, why? I like being with people. The lady in front of me spent 15 minutes picking little lint and hairs off the jacket of her husband. 15 minutes. The whole time I stood there behind them, she kept finding new ones. <laughs> I went, you're right, I would have killed people. I would have probably gone so, <laughs> but, but this thing of it, it's never controlled enough. And that blocks us from experiencing love. It, it blocks us from, from uh, knowing that we're loved, from, from loving other people. This need to be right and to get it down better and get every, you know, don't even go try it with me, you know. And uh, God gave us white jackets, so we don't have to, you know, worry about that. But, um, but these are all ways that we end up missing out on the miracle of what love is. Missing out on the patience and kindness and not envying and not boasting and not proud and not rude and not self-seeking and not easily angered and keeping no record of wrongs and not delighting in evil but rejoicing in the truth. It's protecting, it's trusting, it's hoping, it's persevering, it's never failing. We miss that. Unless we're able to stop, set aside our fear and aversion to hurt, and say, all right, Lord, I'm willing to hurt. That is the prayer that opens the door for us to experience love. I'm willing to hurt. In, um, First John, first John 4, um, uh, it says, let's love one another. Love comes from God. Everyone who's been born of God knows God. Who, uh, who, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
That's what love is. God, love for us, hurt. And frankly, I don't particularly care for hurt. You know? Uh, spent a lifetime trying to have less of that in my life, but the result is I end up having less love, less vulnerability, less kindness, long-lasting, upbuilding, freeing love. And I've got to get to the point where I go, okay, bring it. I'm willing to hurt. You know, we went through this as a congregation. We we loved Charlotte. She loved us. We were family. Um, and it hurts to say goodbye. To, to realize that someone, uh, someone younger than me is in heaven now. And I didn't want to say goodbye to her. So is it better to not allow ourselves to care? To not allow ourselves to get involved in people's lives because they might die? Steve Hayner, who brought up. Uh, my first memory of Steve Hayner, we were invited to a small group when we moved to uh, Seattle. We were invited to be in a small couples group and they were having their first meeting at the Hayner's home. And we were new, never been to Seattle, just starting at our ministry at the University of Presbyterian Church, and uh, scared spitless as we're going to this pastors and spouses small group, weekly small group. And uh, so we take a deep breath. Here we go, walk up to the porch, knock on the door. Steve opens the door, looks at us, smiles, and says, hello, friends, welcome. Come on. The first words that he said to us. We're friends. Come on. And we shared together every week for years. And, uh, and so you go, wow. And he's gone? Maybe it'd been better if we hadn't have gone to that small group. Maybe it'd been better if we didn't get involved and care about their lives and watch their kids grow and all those things. Would that have been better? <clears throat> Why? Because you missed the love. You missed the love. And the love is worth it. That's what I want to tell you. Love hurts. It's worth it.